Oh, hello. Good morning and uh, good afternoon in your uh, respective uh, time zones. Uh, we are now speaking about key number one, the uh, leadership key uh, about uh, adopting the Edinburgh uh, Declaration. And we're going to speak with, uh, uh, with John about that. And uh, John and Tim together uh, also wrote key number three about education and in particular, uh, uh, including uh, psychology and brain science to enhance mediator practice. So hi and welcome. Uh, I would like to give the uh, opportunity first uh, to you to uh, introduce yourself so that uh, we know with whom we are uh, speaking, who you would like to start. John, go ahead. Well, why, why don't I go ahead, Tim? Thank you very much, Lisa. Thank you very much, Manon, for your generous contribution, and indeed to everybody who's made this particular project possible. So I'm John Sturrock. I'm speaking this afternoon. It's the afternoon here in Scotland. I'm speaking from Edinburgh in Scotland, where I am a mediator, although my mediation practice extends throughout the United Kingdom and indeed into Europe and other places as well. I was at one time a practicing lawyer at what's called the Scottish Bar, but for the past 20 years, mediation has been my core professional activity. I also spend quite a bit of time working in the area of policy and decision making and indeed politics and uh, have an extensive practice training and coaching people in conflict resolution as well. Much more to say, but that's probably enough as an introduction, Manon. Thank you very much, John. Tim. Uh, Manon, hello. Thank you. Uh, pleasure to be with you. Um, briefly, uh, since 1993, I've worked as a mediator and facilitator, but these days I present myself more as um, somebody who can assist individuals and groups with communication generally. Uh, although, you know, much of my work is actual mediation uh, or facilitation, but uh, it, it does expand beyond that. And um, so uh, from in the period between uh, 2006 and 2014, um, I had the uh, opportunity to direct the graduate program in conflict resolution at the University of Oregon, which um, I took on uh, because I was very interested in uh, the educational path that leads us to this work. And as you know, uh, historically, 25, in, at least in this country, in the United States, um, 25 hours, 40 hour trainings have been sufficient for people to begin practicing. And I felt strongly that there was so much more to do to prepare people for this work. So um, for those uh, nine years or so, I, I led that program and then um, uh, left at the end of 2014 to return to private practice where I am now. and. Uh, am trying to write a little bit more than I had been and published uh, Embodied Conflict, uh, the neural basis of, of uh, communication and conflict in 2018, I guess it was. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. So I would like to start with uh, the leadership uh, key and uh, speak with John uh, about the Edinburgh uh, Declaration. Um, what was in uh, that piece the, you know, there's a lot of interesting uh, things. I, for example, I read about Scottish invention. I didn't know that the bicycle was a Scottish invention. You know, there you are. Or, or <laughs> and the and the or French or something like that. But okay, well, that uh, maybe a detour we're not going to take uh, today. But in your um, in your publication, what is in fact the core message you want people to get from uh, after reading uh, uh, your uh, article on the Edinburgh uh, Declaration? Well, I think, Manon, it seemed important to, to me at the time that as mediators around the world, we have a lot of common and shared interests. In fact, that's so much of what we try to achieve for other people as well. And I was keen, as were many others, to try to identify what the core values are of mediation, what our aspirations are and hopes are for parties, and to identify and be particularly resolute to ensure that people understand that independence and impartiality lies at the heart of what we do. I think we also were keen to emphasize that mediation is about returning autonomy and decision-making to the parties who are affected by a dispute or a difference or a conflict of sorts. I think we also wanted to emphasize the, the, the move away from the more adversarial binary approach, which 
it covers so much of modern day decision making to the richness that mediation can bring. So there's all of that, trying to embrace, if you like, a, a universal approach to many of these values and standards and to recognize how important it is that education and training reaches a certain understood level so that we are proficient and competent in what we do. And we also wanted to recognize some of the core um, attributes, if you like, of an effective mediation, including, for example, really good listening, um, courtesy and respect, uh, effective use of language, the avoidance of inflammatory language, um, making sure that so far as we can, we identify common ground. There are a number of different component parts to it, but I think, as I read it again that today, actually, it seems to be more than ever before, Manon, the time has come for us to re-engage with that document, that declaration, embrace its wording, and, and share it with all those with whom we seek to work, and use it to make clear, if you like, to publicise the power of what we call mediation to so many folk who would benefit from its use and our involvement in their difficulties and disputes. Yeah, so could, could you say that it is a kind of Hippocratic oath uh, for mediators, uh, or is that uh, not doing it justice? No, I, well, I think it, it, it probably does. The Hippocratic Oath is probably a lot shorter. Oh, yes. I might, might argue that the Hippocratic <laughs> Oath, you know, this would be better being shorter. So it's a much longer uh, desideration, as it were, if that's the right word, desideration of what we do. I think it's, it's explanatory as well as aspirational. It's a commitment by us to what are our common norms, values and goals, but also an attempt, I suppose, to illustrate, even to educate, what it is that we seek to do so that others have confidence about what this process is about and also are assured about our levels of competence as well. And if mediators or maybe even other participants <coughs> like to uh, embrace this declaration, um, how do you propose they do it? Uh, so uh, do you uh, yeah. actually need to sign it? Uh, can you just put it on your website uh, and say that these are the roles, uh, you know, I uh, assign myself to the De Edinburgh uh, Declaration? Um, how to do it? Yeah, well, what was interesting was that in Edinburgh in 2018, over 100 of us, including the, the wonderful Bill Urey, the author of Getting to Yes, after he'd given a magnificent a speech in the Scottish Parliament, followed by our own First Minister. He signed it and all of us signed it. And we actually have that now as a kind of a presentational uh, copy available, I think through the site, website of the International Academy of Mediators. But it was specifically designed, Manon, for use by anybody who, would, who wants to use it. And indeed it can be downloaded and printed off. You can put it on a frame in your wall. You can have your local bar association commit to it, your group of mediators commit to it. I think it's fair to say we have not done as much, and I say we, I'm not sure, I mean, it's, it's a kind of, it's for everybody. More could be done by the body of mediators to promote this more widely. And I think that's the great value of this article in the, in the Seven Keys series, that it re-engages with this, re-promotes it. And at the very end, you'll see a paragraph where I, I suppose I exhort people to please take it and use it and make the very best of it. There was some idea that this might be translated into a number of different languages. And that's, of course, available. There's no copyright on this. So I do hope people will take it and, and work with it and not wait for somebody else to give permission or tell them that they ought to do it. Okay, so whoever is watching this, uh, please go ahead, take uh, the uh, Edinburgh Declaration, uh, sign it, use it, and uh, spread it as broadly as we can. Yeah, and if, if it's not easily accessible, I think it should be on the IAM website, but just cut and paste it from the Mediate.com website. I mean, that's the purpose of putting it there, and use it, uh, please, as you will. Fantastic. Thank you, Madam. So um, I would like to, to move to key number three, uh, the education uh, key, and uh, especially brain science and uh, neuroscience psychology. Uh, Tim, uh, when you look at your uh, publication, what is the core message that you want people to get uh, after they read uh, your uh, publication? Yeah, well, to say the obvious, and I think we use that phrase maybe at the beginning of the article, I haven't read it for a while, but um, we're dealing with human beings and uh, every aspect of what it means to be a human being becomes involved in the work we do. Uh, people's uh, beliefs, understandings, their emotional response to the situation, their uh, conceptual cognitive understanding, 
um, they bring their whole body to the mediation and they particularly bring their mind and their mind is based, uh, I would say, in their brain and extended nervous system. Um, so the core, uh, the core message, I think, is that to practice in this field, um, w practice in this field will benefit from greater knowledge and understanding of what it means to be a human being in all its dimensions, social, psychological, political, uh, et cetera. Uh, and so I think that's the point that we're trying to emphasize um, that education, first of all, could be deeper and broader, but certainly is ongoing. And the, the, the idea of a brief mediation training um, that helps you understand how to do an opening and uh, engage in active listening and reframing is necessary but not sufficient. Mm. And how much uh, uh, would you say um, is necessary to be trained in a neuro and psychology before you can be an effective mediator? I wouldn't claim to set a bar myself um, and it's a good question. I think some work needs to be done on thinking about what comprises a, uh, a basic mediation training. Uh, and I know in your country, I think, and in, in other countries in Europe, the uh, basic mediation training is, is much more extensive than it is, than it is in, in the States. Um, but I think certainly touching on some of the basic understandings of social psychology, in-group, out-group behavior more than we tend to, at least here, and um, I would include uh, the book I wrote, uh, at least in brief, um, in, in brief rendition uh, in um, mediator training. And I've presented to a, a number of, um, in a number of basic trainings and to community mediation centers. And what I find is that people respond very favorably by saying, oh yeah, wow, I hadn't thought of things in that way. And this does, uh, help uh, kind of open a window or a door into what is going on in the mediation room, what is going on for people when they are in conflict, and why is it that we respond as we do to the social dimension uh, that in which, you know, conflict happens. And um, so we're talking about new mediators who are uh, being newly trained and that it is important to, to add this to the curriculum. So uh, what about uh, the established mediators? How can we get them um, up to speed with these kind of new uh, knowledge? Well, I think that this series of uh, papers is one way to just uh, help the, the field consider uh, in a self-reflective way, you know, what we're doing and what we could do and how we could improve and develop. And, you know, I think the field, let's say started in the seventies or so, uh, um, if you want to pin it there, and has had its arc of development, uh, both, both very positively in, in its growth, but also uh, there's been, a, I think, a, a bit of constraint in, its development uh, and applied more uh, prominently in commercial disputes that have almost become um, the setting for within a more adversarial conception of, of dispute resolution. That mediation is almost, I wouldn't say been co-opted, that's a bit extreme, but, but I think that the, the promise of mediation, uh, as Folger and Bush put it, um, has still to be realized. And so I think as a field, we need to think about, as John was saying with the Edinburgh Declaration, um, one of the values is uh, moving people away from the adversarial in a deeper way than maybe we have so far realized that this, you know, can, and, and I know that there's some debate about this, how, uh, how, um, how aspirational we should be in terms of social change. But um, at one end of that spectrum of conversation is the idea that humanity 
in its long arc as it struggles with how to bridge differences and divides um, uh, is on a developmental path and that this field partic can participate in that developmental field to you know, create more peace and harmony in the world, as they say, but at least to resolve differences and uh, conflicts that are an, a, a, an unavoidable part of social relations in a more collaborative way that takes into account the humanity of, of, of the parties, our own humanity that really does take that into account more deeply. Okay, so would it be fair to say in a short summary that uh, the core that you wanted to um, uh, bring in your piece is that we have more understanding how we humans are and that we are humans and how, what happens if you are a human in a, uh, in a conflict? Would that be a fair, very short um, conclusion? Yeah, and we, you know, the field started there uh, in trying to understand the dynamics of, of conflict and the causes of conflict. And we have identified many different causes of conflict. Um, uh, and um, I'm just saying that one of the causes of conflict is our essential nature, so to speak, our, our uh, the basis of our consciousness experience and how we experience the other and ourselves. And so we can just go deeper into an understanding of the causes of conflict. Okay, so going back to the core and adding an extra layer. Uh, John, um, you uh, co-authored uh, this uh, uh, article. Uh, what, what is for you the core of uh, what you uh, would like to communicate? I wonder if I could maybe just add two or three points, Manu. First of all, for me, it was a real honor to share the writing of this piece with Tim. I got to know Tim through his book, Embodied Conflict, which for those who are watching this and listening to it, is simply brilliant. Um, even the preface, the introduction to the book contains more luxury and richness about this field than anything I've, re I've read anywhere else. So uh, I do commend that book indeed. In my own recently published book, A Mediator's Musings, I see I have two articles about Tim's book. So I think what that does, Manon, is it underscores the importance, the central importance of this area of activity in our growing knowledge, our exponentially growing knowledge about our field. So that would be the first point. The second point, I think alluding to training as Tim did, we now spend probably the first half a day of our flagship mediation training course in the area of neuro neuropsychology and cognitive bias. And it, it evolves naturally in conversation, but we get into the work of Daniel Kahneman. Um, we get into the idea of the, the uh, neocortex and the limbic and, 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 and prehistoric part of the brain. We get into fight or flight and thinking fast and thinking slow and all of that. And then all the applications of it, albeit that there's a jargon associated with it, that are so apt and so central to what we do when we understand how people engage with conflict, when we understand why they might resist what we do as mediators, and yet what they can learn to do and to be if they're going to find very productive outcomes in mediation. And in fact, we write about all of that in the chapter. Funnily enough, just behind me here, because I was mediating yesterday over 14 hours in a very complex commercial matter, I have two flip chart sheets. Now, normally in my first session over breakfast with the parties, I would have these flip charts. I would prepare them as I was speaking to people over our morning rolls. So over here, over my, I think might be my left shoulder as you view the screen, but I'm not sure because I'm looking at it in a mirror. I have a piece of cheese and I use a piece of cheese with three mice or three observers from three different vantage points to talk to the parties about the fact that although the piece of cheese is a single fact, a, a, a truth if you like, from the different vantage points, the mice or the observers see different things, a triangle, a square, a pockmarked white rectangle, if you can see it clearly enough on the wall behind. And that allows me to talk about willful blindness, about particularly about confirmation bias, the making of judgments and assumptions about others in the room. We can then explore um, reactive devaluation. I throw these terms out uh, because I think what I'm trying to do there is I'm trying to help people to understand the practical application of this in day-to-day -day mediation. So I would take, for example, confirmation bias, which is the obvious and understood uh, inclination that we have to look only for material which reinforces our conclusions and to disregard and distort that, which is in, in, in constant, not consistent with that. And just to talk about the case and that, and in a sense, the lighthearted way helped to illustrate the point, reactive devaluation, I might say, 
you know, if, if, if Joe here makes an offer to Bill over there, given some of the baggage that you're both carrying, it may be a bill that you would, you would undervalue the, the, what would be a perfectly objective and reasonable offer. So I can help with that. I can help by helping how you frame it. I can even be the messenger and so on and so forth. So I think normalizing the language, taking it away from the intellectual theoretical foundations and applying it right at the heart of what we do. And I know that there are, there are commentaries and, and considerations about how sound some of the science about the brain is because we're learning new things all the time. But I think our own practical experience as negotiators and mediators and indeed as communicators lends us to understand that a lot of this just makes good sense. And if we can render it in language, which is good common sense for commercial people, for family members, for communities, for individuals who are engaged with us, I think we add real value. There's a, there's a bit of research just come out this week, which I haven't had time to, to digest, which is suggesting that the nature of mediation is such that it actually adds real value because of the way it can change people's neuropsychological approach to the disputes and conflict that are involved in. So I think we're just scraping the surface of a fascinating field, but we owe it to ourselves, old and new mediators, to learn more about this and apply it. Great, so uh, actually you're saying I'm applying it not just by educating uh, mediators, but I'm also educating my parties uh, or the participants to the mediation. In fact, everybody should be educated in uh, these kinds of things because it will make the world uh, a different place and our social interaction uh, will be uh, different and better, which brings us back to Tim actually, because that's one of the themes that you uh, picked up. Um, when you look at uh, the seven keys as a whole, uh, or uh, some uh, publications that uh, one of our colleagues uh, wrote, uh, was there something that uh, uh, struck you or something that you found uh, in particular interesting or a takeaway that you had from uh, the whole seven uh, keys? Tim? Uh, yeah, I think the, the main thing I took away from it, well, maybe two things. One is uh, that there is lots of uh, room for development, lots of interest in development, um, and the uh, kind of so the reflective practice aspect of it, that we are, I don't know if we're at any kind of threshold, but uh, we're at an, a moment among moments. Uh, and this moment, I think, reflected in the, in the papers, uh, is is again you know an, another example uh, of the field grappling with its own development, uh, and I think that's the, the the big thing I took away from it, and that's promising, uh, separate from the specific content. Great uh, a way of uh, saying it, the field grappling with uh, its own development. I, I like that a lot. So for you, John, what uh, was a takeaway um, that you have from uh, the seven keys uh, or one of the seven keys? Well, I, I would just say, um, Mao, and it, and it replays a theme that I think we've been touching on. We face an existential crisis as a species. Um, we all see our, our, we've got one planet. Uh, and yet we all see things very differently from our different perspectives. Um, and we tend to fight about what we perceive to be limited resources. If we continue to do that, and it's not just to do with the current pandemic, seriously that is, but particularly with climate change and all that that means environmental damage and havoc. If we continue to do that, our prospects of survival in the long term as a species are growing more and more remote. And actually, interesting enough, the other illustration behind me here, the Venn diagram, even towards the end of the day, the principals would keep looking at this behind me and say, oh, remember John told us that we need to try to converge and find that point in the interest, in, in the intersection where our interests intersect rather than diverge. You know, that, I mean, it's almost like two globes. We have one globe, one planet. We need to find the intersection. And we mediators, as it happens at this time and place, have the resources. Humbly, we have some of the skills and understandings. And I think the skills that we have, it's not just as mediators, you know, narrowly, as Tim says, in the very broadest sense, mediation skills are one of the hopeful signs that may help us to survive as a species. And my goodness me, we need hope. So I think I take that, and I think the seven keys is very timely, particularly at this point in 2020, when things have become much more focused. And we, when we could be at the threshold of what we need, which is a whole new way of being and doing who we are and how we exist as human beings on this planet. 
Oh, that's so beautiful. I'm not going to make a summary of uh, of that because it's a, it's a beautiful speech uh, in uh, in itself. Uh, just being on the threshold that uh, of uh, a whole new development and a new species. I love it. Um, so, is there when we uh, are concluding our uh, interview something else that uh, you would like to to share? So, something we didn't speak about uh, yet, or did we cover the main points? I'd like to emphasize the point that John made, and that is uh, educating the parties. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we're speaking in the paper about educating mediators further, but the opportunity, uh, and I touch on that a little bit in my book as one of the opportunities and one of the challenges, to what degree can we bring this kind of education to the parties within mediations. And I think John is an exemplar of that evidently from, from what I hear of his work. Uh, and, and that's really important. And, and then, you know, I think the other, extending beyond the parties, what can we do as a field to um, educate the public generally uh, and to uh, expand the conceptual frameworks and the specific skills uh, into the general public, whether that's through, you know, the education of children. Um, it's, that's an area that I've not ever worked in. Um, uh, but somehow if we're going to make the change that John was just speaking of, the kind of deep societal change and the way a shift in how humans, um, behave with each other, a shift from our traditional patterns, which have been, uh, challenging and, and fraught with uh, pain and suffering often, uh, both at the interpersonal level and at the, at the public level. If we're really going to shift that, then somehow we need to disseminate uh, the, again, the conceptual ideas and the, and the um, approaches and the understandings into the general public. And I think that's really important. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Tim. John, do you have any last or final thoughts uh, here? For our yeah, I think I think I, I, as I think about it, man, I think I'd like to be quite provocative. I think we mediators have an enormous obligation here to promote what we do and to take it into fields which may be not easy to work in. Now, of course, many mediators do. So I, in a sense, I'm maybe thinking more about the people who are involved in commercial mediation, um, but, but across a broad spectrum, um, there is at the moment a discussion, a debate even within the mediation profession as to whether or not we should be involved in difficult political issues. Some people say that we shouldn't be involved at all because to do that compromises our independence. Others argue that it's entirely consistent with our values to be involved, at least to be facilitators of better conversations. And that much at least must be so, particularly given the predicament that we currently face. But that's, I say must be so, not everybody agrees with that. It's a very good piece by Ken Cloak in his latest book, summarizing some of the arguments on that. But I think there's a danger here, and I'm going to use an expression that we are kind of self-indulgent narcissists, and we think that we, we just keep ourselves away from some of the more difficult and complex stuff, and because it's not our role to be there. I think we need to get in about that while retaining our independence, and indeed, as the declaration says, while accepting that some of the decisions and choices people may make as a result will not necessarily be in accordance with our own values or beliefs. But we need to enable better conversations. We need to enable more constructive communication, uh, consideration of underlying, deep underlying issues, development of options, and then decision making. So I think mine would be a radical call to mediators to think radically. What was it Einstein said? Um, is it imagination is better than knowledge? I think we have to be imaginative now, creative and innovative, and, and quite brave, quite courageous. There's a word here, meekness, which I happen to come across. A meekness is sometimes associated with weakness, but actually the definition of meekness is humble and courageous. I think we mediators have the capacity both to be humble, because that's our role, but also to be brave in what we do. 
Oh, that, uh, that is great. So you are saying we uh, as mediators should not uh, just be mediators uh, when we are on the job, but we need to practice what we preach in all areas of our life. Uh, and uh, we also need to embrace this mediative uh, mindset when going into the trenches and doing whatever work. And that will get us to the threshold and over the threshold to get into a, a new society. Beautifully expressed, Manon. Yes, indeed. <laughs> thank you. Yes. Oh, thank you uh, very, very much, uh, both of you, for uh, this, uh, this interview. Uh, and uh, I uh, look forward to the continuation and uh, to continue reading uh, both of your books. They uh, sound, uh, sound great. So uh, it's going to be vacation time uh, soon. Yes. And so I look forward to <laughs> seeing them. Yeah. Thanks very well, Handel. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, and Tim, it's lovely to see you and lovely to work with you. Yeah, good to see you, John. I always love hearing what you have to say. And I, I particularly like to hear, well, first of all, thanks for your uh, kind words about my book, but um, I really appreciate your approach to mediation from the, you know, you're gathering the parties for breakfast beforehand to the way that you try and educate the parties to prepare them so they can engage fruitfully. And um, so I, I think you're a great model. Well, yeah. Thank you for saying that. Well, that's that's at least in part because I and others are able to learn from people like you who have given us so much guidance. So I think we all benefit from each other in different ways. And then, Manon, you're making such an effort to bring all of this through the seven keys with all, all this work as well. So let's just all pat each other on the back mutually and say we're all doing our own bit in our own way. <laughs> <laughs> I very much like that.